Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Amrik. I am the director of customer success at the Dability team, and we are the makers of the Survey CTO data collection platform. Thanks so much for joining us for this installment of our webinar series. We're here today to learn from one of our users, Dr. Sarah Aliuha, based at the Al Jabbar Al Ahmad Al Sabah Hospital in Kuwait. While Sarah is a plastic surgeon by training and profession, given her medical research background and the all hands on deck nature of the COVID 19 health crisis, she has shifted the focus of her work in 2020. We'll learn more about that from Sarah in just um, a moment. Um, before we do get started, please do check out the message that I've pasted into the chat window. You'll see a, a link to start with amongst um, what I've pasted, which is the feedback link for our webinar. So we would love to know about your experience attending the webinar. So please do share. Otherwise, follow through the other links to, to learn more about those resources. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, so if your connection drops out or if you'd like to share this webinar uh, with anybody else, uh, you're welcome to share the link. The webinar will be posted in our video library. So just before I hand over to Sarah, I'll briefly mention the Safe People and Data Initiative. The Safe People and Data Initiative has been spearheaded by the team at Dubility, and we'd like to grow it through your participation and support. We're aiming to look beyond technology, which we still feel is very important, to focus on best practice for safe data collection, which can involve a mix of tools and methods for research and data collection. The, object the objective um, with the Safe People and Data Initiative is sharing experiences and resources to help foster resilience and adaptation in the face of our current health crisis. And whatever the future holds, we held an inaugural panel discussion earlier this month, featuring speakers from the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, the Global Development Lab at USAID, the Development Impact Evaluation Group at the World Bank, and the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab in South Asia, otherwise often called JPAL, and lastly, Innovations for Poverty Action. So this webinar or panel discussion rather can be reviewed um, as a recording in our video library, which we can see here. And if any of your work happens to overlap with what we are trying to do with the Safe People and Data Initiative, please get in touch. We would love to hear more about how you are adapting your work in the face of our current circumstances. Okay, well, thanks for your patience. And without further ado, I will um, hand over to Sarah, who will first uh, run us through our overview. And she might from time to time prompt me to change slides because I'll be managing the slide presentation. Sarah, over to you. I thank you so much, Eric, for this uh, great introduction. I'd like to thank the Dubility team for this invitation to share experience at uh, Jabir Ahmed Hospital. Uh, like you said, with COVID-19, uh, we've all had to leave our comfort zone and we've been placed in roles that we're not usually accustomed to. And uh, Survey CTO has interestingly been part of our journey. Uh, so, just to give the audience a brief overview of what we'll be talking about today, I'll talk a little bit about the hospital itself and uh, who I am, uh, just to give you some context. I'll also talk about the COVID-19 research team that I've been part of, and also why we chose to work with Survey CTO uh, to apply it to, uh, you know, our clinical work. And then I'll just touch briefly on uh, a research manuscript that we recently published. And obviously at the end, we'll take some questions. So Jabal Ahmed Hospital is interesting. In Kuwait, we haven't had new hospitals for quite a long time. It's only two years old. Uh, 
although it's uh, brand new, it's uh, one of the most modern hospitals we have here in Kuwait. It's uh, large uh, for Kuwaiti standards. I don't know if many of you know of Kuwait, but it's a pretty small country next to uh, Saudi Arabia and Iraq. Uh, our population is around 4 million people. And Jabir's hospital covers quite a broad catchment area. So we have 1,140 bed hospital. And we didn't start with 148 ICU beds. We started with 20, but now we have 148 ICU beds with COVID. So this uh, hospital is based in a residential area in Kuwait called South Sura. And when I first came to Kuwait, this hospital was only functioning at around 20% capacity, and that's it in February. However, now it's almost 100% capacity. So the first cases of COVID-19 that were admitted at our site uh, were actually from repatriation flights. So what happened in Kuwait is when news <laughs> broke out in uh, Kuwait that uh, there was an outbreak in Iran, all citizens from Kuwait were flown uh, back to Kuwait and they were screened at the airport and placed in quarantine. And they were kept in quarantine unless they had two negative swabs. All the positive cases in Kuwait were then transferred to Jabir al Ahmed Hospital. And all the patients that were not from, that were not COVID 19 patients were transferred to other sites. So from uh, March 2020, Jabra Hospital became a COVID-19 hospital that was purely dedicated for COVID-19 and nothing else. So that was a turning point for us. So I'm actually, uh, like uh, Amrik said, I'm a plastic surgeon from Kuwait and I, my return to Kuwait coincided with COVID-19. So I only got here in mid-February. And um, interestingly, this was the same time that COVID kicked off. So I started working at the hospital for one week and then suddenly uh, all hell broke loose. And because of the circumstance, uh, I became part of the, what we call the COVID-19 research team. So why was this research group created? Well, we, there was an initiative to capitalize on the fact that all the COVID-19 patients in Kuwait were going to be based at a single site. So this was a good opportunity for us to understand this new disease. And due to the fact we had to create a database or some sort of a registry for all these patients that had COVID-19 at Jabir Hospital. Uh, one of the issues is one, there was a time issue. So we had to do this very, very quickly. Um, IT team and everyone who would usually do this was very busy. Uh, a lot of the, you know, the companies that would have done this were hard to source. And we looked into several platforms. So I know that for medical research, Red Cap is a classic go-to. Part of the issues we faced was that uh, we didn't have a university affiliation and that's sort of a prerequisite for REDCap. We thought about Google Forms, but it wasn't quite right. There was another company called Dendrite. So we, you know, we explored these things and they all had their challenges, like uh, would have taken a long time to set up or expense. And when I came across Survey CTO, I tried a demo and it seemed to work pretty well for what we wanted to do. And very kindly, Survey CTO, if you were involved in COVID-19 research, uh, was offered for free, which amazed me, to be honest. So I thought that was great. Before I move on, this is just a picture of some of the teams. So uh, all these individuals have been involved in uh, data collection for us as a research group and helping organize uh, quite a few research projects. So that's just the team pausing with and without gear. So, you know, what we ended up using Survey CTO primarily as a first project was using it as a registry uh, and used it to enter data that was entered in the, so 
you know, it was a great fit for us for these reasons. I found it to be very user friendly and the interface was very flexible, even though I don't have any coding background or a lot of software knowledge, it was very easy to use enabled me to track users and administer them in a very uh, easy way. For our data collectors, our data collectors were almost 100% physicians. So the phone application was pretty easy for us to use. All it required was a 10 minute uh, online meeting where I showed them how to do it. And then everybody was able to use it successfully. So that was nice. I think some of the limitations with the web-based registries is the not having it in an application form. Also, when people were using tablets or iPhones, you know, within the context of a COVID-19 hospital, disinfection is uh, important. So with paper, can't really wipe it down. However, with uh, the fact that we could just use a phone application, it was easy to put plastic covers and disinfect the hardware that we're using. Also, it was really useful to use the data monitoring capabilities. So it enabled us to get information about our hospital instantly, which was great. We we're able to know the status of most of the patients. And when it came down to do data analysis um, and using doing some statistical analysis, the export function was fantastic. You could easily export your data in the perfect format to Excel or SPSS directly. So I know our statisticians love that we use this software. A big plus for us in Kuwait, because the first language is Arabic, is that you could use multiple languages. So I know for other studies, the fact that we're able to incorporate Arabic or Bengali in our forms was very useful. And the last point was really important for us is that the, you know, the I was pretty confident that our data was secure which, uh, you know, within the legal framework for uh, clinical work was really important for us. So I'll touch briefly on the study that we carried out. Uh, so it was very basic. Every patient that was admitted consecutively to Jabber Hospital during the study period had uh, data entered manually by the physicians. So uh, the unique thing about the study is that you know, we're representing our entire population because every single person who was admitted there at the time of the study. Initially, the first month, we had data for a thousand patients. Then over time, we expanded it to include over 4,000 patients. I know bigger countries have much bigger databases, but for us, this was probably one of the biggest databases uh, that we had ongoing, like a prospective registry. And this data was used for several purposes, but uh, one of the main purposes for our main research study was just to establish the baseline characteristics for COVID-19 patients in Kuwait. And we also looked at risk factors for patients either succumbing to the disease or being admitted to the intensive care unit. So if anyone's interested, this was our paper. This was the first one. So it's looking at characteristics, risk factors, and outcomes among the first consecutive 1,096 patients diagnosed with COVID-19 in Kuwait. So uh, we're proud of the fact this was one of the first papers to be peer-reviewed and published in our country, uh, which was very exciting for us. You know, this is just one example. So using that database, we're able to look at uh, several other things. Just by having that confidence with the survey CTO platform, we're able to expand this platform to help us with other studies we're looking at. So just some of the examples where we've used this interface for other types of medical research. One of the projects we've started and recruited around 200 patients so far was just looking at risk factors for getting COVID-19 uh, for healthcare workers. So this is a phone-based survey, and for uh, you know healthcare workers who agree to take part, we invite them to come to Jabber Hospital and test them, uh, do immunological testing to see if they've been exposed to COVID-19 during their line of work. The phone-based survey worked really well uh, for our team through Survey CTO, and some of the integrations were with text were very useful.
The other project was uh, we've been doing random screening in the community. So we uh, have data for around 12,000 people and those are face-to-face -face encounters. However, the fact that our doctors are able to use tablets was uh, very useful because for the same reason that it's easy to disinfect and it's quicker. And you know, you're able to take pictures when the need arises. And then another example is we've been doing similar to the first study, just a chart review where we're tracking surgical outcomes for COVID-19 patients. So I think it's uh, revolutionized things for us. And the nice thing about it is as soon as data collectors and physicians were comfortable with the software, any idea or ongoing project we had, we were able to um, you know, utilize the same platform and be consistent with it. So it's been great, honestly. So relevant features for us, I mean, the great thing about the software is it's so flexible and you're able to customize it to your needs. And for me, because I'm not IT savvy, the great thing was if I wasn't sure how to get the software to do something that I wanted to, to do, the survey CTO desk is always very accommodating. So usually you get an answer within 24 hours and anything I didn't think we could do with survey CTO, it turns out we could do, which was great. The image capture part is great for several reasons. Uh, for us, when we are doing face-to-face -face interviews, we're able to take pictures of uh, people's IDs and check that the manual data that was entered is accurate. And I'm sure people can think of other ways to incorporate images or videos. The monitoring capabilities uh, is great for two reasons. Uh, one, it allowed us to uh, track what our data collectors were doing and to see where they were up to also helped us ensure the data was accurate. And the other thing, uh, it enabled us to see where we're at and what our preliminary results showed. Probably the most uh, useful part for us was the export function, the way the data was presented to statisticians. I mean, uh, they thought it was great. Like once we did some data cleaning, it was ready to go. So it was very efficient in that sense. And Really, the phone application has been great because uh, it just the learning curve for that is so low that anyone could become a data collector for us, and that was just great for us. Great, thanks, uh, Sarah. I think that um, that brings us to the end of of your uh, slides that you prepared. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much for. Um, the presentation. I mean, personally, I've, I've found this this really um, interesting. I mean, the, the, t the practical tidbits about um, how to um, prepare your team in the face of this sort of challenge, um, I think, are, are really uh, useful. Um, even even just little things about thinking about disinfecting um, devices is really useful. Also. It's interesting that I didn't think about um, in enough detail um, before now. Actually, in some ways, while Kuwait, as you say, is a small country, my understanding is um, Kuwait has been well um, resourced. I mean, I understand your, your team have been under a lot of pressure, but at the same time, compared to larger countries that have been more overwhelmed um, in the face of these challenges. Uh, there is perhaps a unique learning and research opportunity in a scenario where you are well prepared to uh, track uh, cases and, and trace them and uh, understand the, the spread of the disease, including symptoms. So I'm sure there'll only be more useful findings coming out of, of the work that your team is doing. Um, so that, that's, that's really great. So uh, audience, uh, We'll move to Q&A just in a moment, but first I'd just like to share some info about two upcoming webinar events. Uh, firstly, on se September 16th, we have a webinar overview of the Early Grade Reading Assessment, or EGRA, uh, with a guest from an education nonprofit called Room to Read. 
EGRA is something of a gold standard test for evaluating aptitudes of young readers. EGRA is possible today on SurveyCTO using field plugins developed by the SurveyCTO team. Room to Read happen to be experts in the execution of EGRA, uh, with this test being integral to their processes. Um, so that's on September 16th. Secondly, on September 30th, we have a guest webinar from ID Insights, who will um, be speaking to us to share insights and best practice around improving phone survey response rates. ID Insight is a global advisory, data analytics and research organization, and they generally work in the area of development, looking to help maximize um, social impact on various programs. Many researchers, including the ID Insight team, have pivoted towards phone surveying this year, just like Sarah's team is doing. And sometimes response rates for phone surveys can be disappointing. Um, ID Insight have managed a number of large-scale telephone surveys in India uh, to date using SurveyCTO, integrated with the Exitel cloud telephony service. And they're looking to share some of those insights with us. So if either of these topics are interesting to you, we uh, invite you to attend and let your colleagues know because I'm sure there will be definitely something interesting if you, if you work in education from time to time and if you are conducting phone surveys across these two events. So let's um, move to Q&A.